Hi there, esteemed audience, and welcome to another episode of Middle Grade Ninja. I'm your host, Rob Kent. As you know, I'm the author of Banneker Bones and the Cyborg Conspiracy, the third book in the trilogy. And by God, it's available now. You could be reading it now. I assume you've already read the first two books. If you haven't, good news, you can get that first book, Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees, as a paperback, uh, an audiobook, and the ebook is free. Free to download whenever you're watching or listening to this, wherever fine ebooks are sold. So get yourself a copy, get more information about those books, plus hundreds, thousands of interviews with uh, uh, literary agents, authors, editors, publishing professionals, all the folks I know you're going to be interested in at Middle Grade Ninja. And that's it. That's that's all we have time for. My God, there's 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 two of you tonight. We've we've got a full house. We <laughs> we need to get started. Uh, I'm I couldn't be more thrilled. My uh, guests this evening are Seba uh, Sulaimun uh, and Kyle Lukov. Uh, and thrilled to chat with both of you. Uh, esteemed audience knows that I want to make uh, friends in the industry, so I never summarize other people's books and I never summarize other people's biographies. Uh, so Seba, I'm going to ask you to go first and give uh, esteemed audience kind of an overview of your background. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Saba Suleiman. I'm an agent at Talcott Nash Literary. We're a small agency located or based in Milford, Connecticut. I would say located, but we are all now remote. And this was actually before the pandemic. Um, so we all live outside of Connecticut, except for our president who still lives there and, you know, does the checks the mail, as it were. Um, and I have been in publishing now for, I um, want to say, six-ish years. I started out in editorial. I was actually at a romance imprint um, interning. Yes, Kyle. <laughs> Kyle's like, what? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that was my first experience. I was very green. I, I applied for the internship, and they, they asked me if I could read and write, and I said yes, and they hired me. <laughs> And I'm so glad they had so much faith in me because the first thing they asked me to do was to write back cover copy. And I had no idea what that was. And I hadn't read the book and it was due the end of the day. So to say that they threw me in the deep end is an understatement. Um, but I'm so grateful that they did that because it was exactly the experience I needed to sort of clarify in my mind that this was what I wanted to do with my life, just publishing. Before which I definitely had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. <laughs> Um, so I was there for about a year or so, and then I, I switched over to agenting when I figured that I still wanted a job and no one was giving me a job. And then my boss at Sourcebooks, at the Romance Imprint there, connected me with my current boss. So I started interning with her and then I started assisting her and then she offered me a job and I never looked back and that's my background. Um, in terms of what I represent. I represent um, both adult and children's fiction and nonfiction. So we run the gamut. We're a generalist agency. Yeah. Esteemed audience, I promise before we're done, we're going to find out more details about the exact types of books that, that Sub is looking for, probably your book. So so get excited. Stay tuned uh, for that. I am curious, when you're in a situation like that, that the, at the, it's the end of the day, you haven't read the book, they're like, read the back or write the back copy. One, how do you pull that off? And two, do you say, hey, I've never done this before. Oh my gosh. Or do you just do the actor and like, of course I can ride a horse and cast me in your movie and then I'll figure it out later. Well, I, first of all, I assume they, they asked me to do it because they thought I could do it. And so I, I did, I was pretty frank with them. I asked them, first of all, what back cover copy was since I didn't know what it was. And then when I said, well, clearly, I mean, you know, if I were to describe the, the main conflict of the story, it would be helpful to read the book. And I don't know if I've had that time. And they said, Saba, no one reads the book. <laughs> So yeah, everyone, I'm sorry to break your hearts, but most of the people in your publishing team have not read your book. And that's why all of those summaries that we write and the synopses and all of those check-ins you make sure you do or your agent does on your behalf in terms of whether the cover, the person on the cover has blonde hair, but the person actually has red hair, stuff like that happens all the time. So we have these big databases where they have very specific descriptions of all of the characters. And then there's a synopsis that basically gets logged in to the system that I'm guessing the author wrote way back when, when they were on submission. And that's what most people base their pitches on, their marketing sales pitches, the back cover copy, all of that. So they gave it to me and I read it and I said, okay, let me try it. And I did. 
good news is I don't think we're going to say anything more heartbreaking the, the whole show. <laughs> You're not reading the books. Oh, my God, no. There's just too many of them. You know, I, I know it is heartbreaking, but there's just too many books and not enough time. And I think feel like that's just everyone's conundrum in this industry overall. So, yeah. I'm ordering everyone in publishing a time turner. We're going to get those books read. We'll, we'll be all right. Uh, Kyle, uh, same question to you. Please give us uh, an overview of your background. Yeah. Um, so I got hired at Barnes & Noble when I was 16. And it was the only job that I ever really liked. Um, I went to like college and I did some other things. Like I had internships at like various like feminist or whatever organizations. Um but I always just kept going back to Barnes and Noble, like on summer vacations or whatever. And then I graduated from college and I tried to go to law school for like a minute. And then I went crazy and I dropped out. Like I had to go to a hospital for a little while. It wasn't a good scene. Uh, so I dropped out of law school and I got some job that actually is like vaguely related later to publishing, but it wasn't at the time. Um, and I hated it. And I was like, I just want to work at a bookstore again. I just want to help people find books. I don't know. Um, and then after about a year of that, I was hanging out on my friend's houseboat because that was where he lived in Brooklyn and he was opening up his mail and he, he like got a letter and he was like, Hey, I got into library school. And I was like, library school. Is that a, is that like a thing? Do you go there to be a librarian? And he was like, I think so. Um, and I was like, why aren't I in library school? I should be in library school. That sounds like the same job that I'm doing now, but with more money and fewer dirty diapers left off the shelves, which actually might not be true if you work in a public library. Um, <laughs> so I went to library school. I became an elementary school librarian. And when I was starting at my job, um, I tried to write a young adult novel uh, and that did not go very well. I worked very hard on it for many years and nobody wanted it, which is fine. Um, so I pulled out this like funny little idea that I had had in my inbox from like a decade before about the collective nouns of animals. And I was like, well, I clearly can't write young adult. Maybe this will be a picture book. Cause at that point I'd like learned how to write a query letter. I knew how to take rejection. Like I knew where to find agents to query. So I sent it out to a couple people and someone liked it enough to sign me as their client. Um, and that was how I got started in publishing with like this little picture book called The Storytelling of Ravens that then it turned into another book with the same publisher called Explosion at the Poem Factory. Um, and then that agent and I amicably parted ways and I sold When Aiden Became a Brother, which is another picture book by myself. And then I also sold the Call Me Max series on my own. Um, and then I decided to, I went back to this middle grade draft after I sold Call Me Max, like literally the day I got the news that I had sold the Max series. I was like, oh, I can write more books. Maybe I'm not bad at this thing. So I went back and found this old middle grade draft that had been like languishing in my like Google Drive for a couple of years that I thought wasn't any good. And I reread it and I was like, this isn't awful. Like if this was a book, I might recommend it to one of my students. So I decided to finish it. Um, and then I queried Subba with it, which is not the first time that we had corresponded. More on that later. And she liked it and now it's a book and now I have so that novel, Too Bright to See, which comes out next month, is my seventh published book. And then we have 15 minus seven. What is that? Eight more. Eight, am I right? Yes, eight more after that. So I've got uh, when everything that is under contract is a real book that people can hold, it will be 15. And hopefully I will have more, but I don't know, because that seems like a lot. Well, you're, uh, you're a full-time writer now, aren't you? What do you say? So you're a full-time uh, author now, yeah, aren't you? that's my whole job. <laughs> that's fantastic. You're living the dream. So Thanks we, to Saba. we got to find like... out more about how you've achieved that and more about how Saba has, I assume, helped you uh, achieve the, the dream of being a, a full-time author. And I want to, this is a, a middle grade ninja first. I don't think we've ever had the author uh, and their agent uh, on on the show before, so we were we're going to learn all about how you uh, came to to met all the professional uh, charming things you said that Seba knew she had to sign you as a, a client right away. I uh, want to want to hear all about that, um, but um, I'm I'm curious. 
when did you go from, I don't want to take you back to that dark place of, of, of being uh, attempting to be a lawyer, but when did you uh, realize that, oh, I shouldn't just be selling books, I should be writing them and they should specifically be geared toward children? When did I decide to not just help people find books, but to write my own? Um, and I should I should qualify yeah. the just there because helping people find books is tremendous. There's no just yes. about it. <laughs> Go no, it's, it is a vocation as well. Um, you know, it's it's like kind of the question like how did you decide to become a writer? And I've never had a good answer for that. You'd think that after being asked it like a million times, I would have an answer. But it just I just did. Like after college, I had this, I, like I just started writing a thing and it wasn't much good. And it was really just like therapy in the form of fiction. Um, but I just, I don't know, like I, I have a lot of friends but I also get lonely a lot. And I found that writing was a way to keep me from feeling lonely because it was something to do. It was something that kept me like busy and not thinking about being lonely. Um, and it was also something that felt like productive and not just it felt like more than just killing time. Um, so I would like come up with writing projects that would sometimes turn into like little short published pieces and sometimes not. And then I decided to like really seriously attempt breaking into fiction with young adult because I don't know, like it's popular, like it's what people on Twitter are doing these days. Um, and I also had like some feeling of spite about it. Like I didn't at that point, when I started writing, I don't think that I knew of any traditionally published young adult fiction with a trans masculine character, main character. Maybe I didn't know of some, it was a long time ago. And I definitely didn't know any trans men who were traditionally published in YA. And I was like, I wanna be the first, like I wanna do it so that like no cis person gets to do this before I do, so there. Um, and so like, I kind of felt like I had a time limit. Like I need to get this book published before some cis person like does it first, which I don't recommend that. Like I, I always recommend projects out of spite. Like I think spite can be a great motivator, but that kind of time limit, I don't think is helpful because I think it made me like rush through and feel like the end goal was getting published, not the end goal was writing the best book that I possibly could. Well, that's wonderful. We should uh, we need to put that as an official quote someplace on your on your website. That's great. <laughs> <By all means. laughs> 